At this point, I'd like to introduce Dr. Erica Bagley, who is an East Penn resident, as well as a parent of East Penn students. Um, and she's also a professor of psychology at Muhlenberg College. And she's going to share with us the initial part of the presentation in which she's focusing on that topic of adolescent sleep, as well as the research that we have learned nationally, as well as locally from our survey. Dr. Bagley. Um, can you hear me okay? Everybody can hear me okay? Um, yes. All right. Uh, so what I have for you guys tonight is really a presentation where um, I'm sort of reviewing and trying to provide a foundation in terms of what we know about adolescent sleep, um, some problems around adolescent sleep, and really sprinkle in some of the findings that we have from the surveys that um, we sent out in, in May and June. Um, so if you don't mind, I guess if you could hold questions until the end so I can kind of get the foundation out there and I think um, hopefully any questions you have will quickly be clarified through the presentation. Um, all right, so I think one of the most basic things we might ask ourselves in terms of adolescent sleep is how much sleep do adolescents really need? And um, there seems to be some misperceptions, maybe, about how much sleep adolescents actually need. Um, the thought that they are no longer really kids who are growing um, might be out there. Uh, and the truth of the matter is that adolescents need just as much sleep as kids, and arguably at moments in development might need more. Um, but what researchers have kind of concluded is that generally speaking somewhere between eight and ten hours a night is what adolescents need for optimal functioning and you might ask well where do they, how do they get those numbers um, a lot of them are just sort of based on population studies um, but they've done some experimental research more recently because of this topic of adolescent sleep becoming so prominent. Um, and so they've done some experimental laboratory research where they bring adolescents into a laboratory and sleep deprive them at, at different levels and then kind of look at when do they have optimal functioning. Um, and so those studies kind of conclude somewhere around 9.3 hours is in general what adolescents need for optimal functioning. That finding, along with the population studies of, you know, showing how much sleep adolescents are getting, really led um, the CDC, the American Academy of Pediatrics, National Sleep Foundation, all to kind of wave red flags about this problem of sleep deprivation um, in adolescents in America. So the CDC, sort of acknowledging this problem, went out to really conduct a nationwide study um, and look at how much sleep adolescents are getting. Um, and this study back in 2015, they found six out of 10 middle school students and seven out of 10 high school students were not getting at least eight hours of sleep per night um, on school nights. And so um, here's, here's sort of the first bit of data from our surveys. Um, and what we found was actually middle school students, um, about 34% are not getting their required minimum of eight hours. Um, but 79% of high school students are not getting that minimum of eight hours. Um, and again, really the eight is sort of the bare minimum we're talking about in terms of um, helping adolescents get to that point of sort of optimal functioning. And when I'm talking about optimal functioning, what am I talking about? Um, sleep is really quite fundamental for a number of systems in the body, um, both in terms of health. Um, so we know, for example, the immune system is really um, hurt when adolescents and humans in general <laughs> aren't getting enough sleep. Um, there's also quite a bit of literature linking obesity and lack of sleep in adolescents. We also know that during adolescence, um, the body is still growing quite a bit. Um, and the truth of the matter is, is that a lot of that growth is happening while adolescents are asleep. Um, they really need that time for their bodies to grow. And not only are their bodies growing, but their brains are growing. So one of the things we have come to know is that there's that prefrontal cortex region of our brain that helps us with making really good executive decisions is really going through a growth spurt during, during adolescence. Um, and so sleep is really fundamental to helping that happen um, in the ways that it needs to. 
Of course, um, we're here at school district. Cognitive functioning is really important in terms of thinking about um, adolescents and their need for sleep. So one of the things we know, for example, is that um, memory is really um, affected by lack of sleep because we do do what we call memory consolidation while we are sleeping. Um, and so the things that an adolescent is learning during the day, those things are sort of processed and filtered through and become real memories um, that, that are going to be used the next day in school. And when adolescents aren't getting enough sleep, they aren't able to sort of make use of all of that important thing, all those important things happening while they're sleeping. And then finally, um, sleep is really important in terms of helping adolescents regulate their emotions. So there's been quite a bit of research linking adolescent sleep um, deprivation with mental health problems such as anxiety and depression and also externalizing behavior problems. So when we look at East Penn, um, we asked adolescents from middle school into high school um, using a standardized score um, for sleepiness. We asked them about, you know, there was a variety of questions they were asked in terms of a checklist of how often are you experiencing these symptoms of sleepiness. And what we found was that particularly into the high school years, we see quite a bit of sleepiness being reported um, by adolescents in the district. That is sort of paralleled with the fact that both teachers, parents, and students are all saying, because um, these were sort of self-report, to what extent do you think sleepiness is affecting learning, behavior, and well-being? And um, teachers, parents, and students overwhelmingly reported that they agree that this was affecting um, what's going on in the classroom and what's going on within people's homes. The other important thing to note um, is that sleepiness is affecting the extent to which adolescents are getting to school. Um, so when asked um, high school students and middle school students, about 24% of high school students reported that they've been late three or more times during the school year because of sleepiness, 20% for middle school. 18% of high school students and 10% of middle school students reported being absent three or more times because of sleepiness. Um, in addition to getting to school, we also know that a lot of adolescents are driving. Um, and in our survey, 36% of the students who drive reported they are driving while sleeping, which is quite dangerous and arguably just as bad as drunk driving. So now that I've kind of given you an idea of you know, how much adolescents need sleep and why they need it, how does it work? Um, <laughs> And one way in which we might look at this question of, you know, well, if adolescents need more sleep, they should just go to bed earlier, right? Um, and the truth is, what we know about how sleep functions and how sleep is maintained, um, particularly during adolescence, it's really not that simple. Um, there are a couple things really basic that I just want to explain quickly about how sleep works. So the best model we have for understanding how sleep works is this, what we call the two-process model of sleep. Essentially, we have two systems that regulate our sleep, that help us feel sleepy and, and tell us when it's time to go to sleep and, and then tell us when it's time to wake up. Um, these systems ideally are working together. So we have the circadian system, which is, you know, giving us, sunlight is helping us give all these cues about when is it daytime and the light gets darker and we start hearing, you know, the nighttime's bird chirping and, and we start to feel tired, right? So we have these, these these systems that are sort of set by very um, common rhythms in life, and that's our circadian system. We also have what we call the sleep drive system, which is essentially the idea that we have a certain amount of, of energy during to, to use, and we are going to use it up, and at the point at which it is sort of exhausted is when we feel tired. Ideally, again, those two systems are working together so that the time at which your body is releasing melatonin, bringing down cortisol levels, it's also the same time when your body is tired. Um, that, that's great. It works for some of us really well. During puberty, however, there's, there's some changes to both of these systems that we've come to understand. And it really makes it harder for adolescents to just fall asleep earlier. Um, and so one of the things we know, for example, is that sleep pressure system really builds more slowly in postpubertal adolescents. 
Um, and we also know that those circadian rhythms are shifted as well, something we call the circadian shift, um, that really turn those morning lark kids, elementary school kids, <laughs> into, into night owl, middle school, and high school students. Um, and so a lot of people have experienced this, and you know, there are real biological processes behind why this is happening. There's also social changes happening, right, in the adolescent's life. There are a lot more um, academic demands being placed on them, lots more responsibilities, both at home, maybe a job. Um, there's a lot more things in the world that are exciting them and that are distracting them, right? Um, socializing, um, being one of them, but also opportunities for engaging in extracurricular activities and sports. Um, while all of this stimulation is happening for adolescents, it's also interesting interesting to note, it's the same time around when parents are really relinquishing a lot of control around sleep. So, you know, a lot of parents um, are no longer holding their kids to bedtimes any longer. Um, in, our, in our survey, we actually found that about half of um, middle school students had reported having a bedtime before 10 o'clock, um, but less than 25% of high school students did. The other thing that might be floating around there in terms of thinking about how do we deal with this problem might be, well, adolescents can just, you know, catch up on sleep on the weekends, right? Um, and, or maybe just take some extra naps. The truth is, is that that really, that idea and, and actually engaging in those behaviors can, can have negative effects in the long run. Um, catch up sleep doesn't really work. For one thing, if you are sleepy in your first period class, catching up on sleep the night later is not going to somehow make you awake what you missed last first period, right? Um, so there, we can't go backwards in time in terms of, of reviving ourselves. But there's also other reasons why catch-up sleep isn't a great idea. Um, one of those is, is a problem we call social jet lag. Um, so what we see oftentimes in adolescents is that the ways in which they are sleeping during weekdays, school nights, and weekends are quite different. Um, they're, they're really sleeping in on the weekends and catching up, maybe, <laughs> if they think, on that sleep. However, what that does, essentially, is create a situation where they have gone to a different time zone on the weekend. Um, and as many parents know, what that means for a Sunday night or a Monday morning is something very painful um, because trying to get back um, to that, that time zone that is your weekday life is really challenging. So we have some data, actually national data and um, East Penn data, that looks at this issue of the difference between the kinds of sleep adolescents are getting during weeknights and weekends. Um, so the top left here, I'm sorry, it's hard to see, but essentially what you see is the top line is the hours of um, sleep that adolescents are getting when it is a weekend, and the red line is what they are getting when it's um, a school night, and across the bottom you're seeing 6th grade to 12th grade. And so that's national data. We have the same data from our study this, this June, um, and we really see the same pattern. Um, so what you see, sort of that top orange line, is the sleep that adolescents are getting on the weekends. And that's somewhere around 9.3 hours, actually. <laughs> um, and the sleep that adolescents are getting on school nights, and you see that sort of decline across the, the four years of high school in particular. So you've got a, a challenge really created by the ways in which adolescents are dealing with their sleepiness. Um, so that this catch-up sleep that's happening on, on the weekends is really kind of putting their systems out of sync with one another. Um, the other thing that adolescents will do, um, oftentimes, and adolescents in East Penn, is engage in napping behavior. And while napping might seem like a rather innocuous way to deal with being tired, um, it's not necessarily the best way to approach this problem. Um, one of the things we know, for example, is that REM sleep, that one that's really important for memory consolidation that I talked about that happens while we are sleeping, um, the amount of REM sleep that you get across the night increases as you are asleep longer. 
So what the very top in the first few hours, percentage-wise, what you're getting in terms of REM sleep is very small, and it grows across the night. That's why we need continuous sleep. That's why we need sleep that is not interrupted. Um, so napping and, and just adding the two-hour nap you got to the five hours you got last night is not really the same as getting seven hours of sleep. The other problematic thing that adolescents often do to engage themselves and sort of stimulate themselves to get out of feeling so sleepy is stimulant use. Um, and we know that stimulant use is on the rise um, in terms of both energy drinks, um, caffeine, and, and other drugs that adolescents may be taking for other reasons. Um, they may be using those to, to help keep themselves awake. Um, so clearly, um, stimulant use during the day, it's not a good habit to start in high school. <laughs> um, it has its own health consequences, and of course there's abuse potential there. So from our survey of East Penn students, um, this is specifically looking at high school students, um, they, they reported quite a bit that they are battling sleepiness during the day. And so we asked them questions about what they do in order to deal with their sleepiness during the day. Um, about a quarter reported napping during the school week, um, and about a quarter also reported consuming caffeinated beverages to keep up with um, their sleepiness. Another 18% also reported eating sugary foods, um, and that link to obesity is sort of part of that, that bigger picture. So as we put all of this together, um, I, I want to sort of impress upon you that Adolescent sleep is a very complex thing. Sleep in humans is complex. What, what helps us fall asleep, what, what helps us maintain good quality sleep, what, what gets us up in the morning and going and not feeling sleepy during the day, all of that is complex. Um, there's been quite a bit of research really trying to understand um, what, what sort of drives adolescent sleep because we have recognized the problem. As I've tried to sort of summarize, there's a variety of biological mechanisms, particularly around the time of puberty, that are really shaping adolescent sleep. And there's a whole bunch of stuff in terms of adolescent lives, including these psychosocial pressures that are up here, that really affect how much time adolescents have to sleep. Um, but on the other end of the equation, in terms of what time adolescents are waking up, one of the things that we know really dictates the time at which adolescents are going to wake up is what time they have to start school. Um, and so thinking about sort of where school start time fits into this larger picture, um, it might be a point of intervention. So many school districts have kind of looked at this issue um, across the country. There has been um, movements around school start time changes. Um, dating back to the early 90s, people have been sort of playing around with this idea. Um, and so there have been quite a few school districts that have done this where we can now look at the data from all of those schools and say, you know, what is the impact of school start time changes? Um, and I can't pretend that for every minute you give an adolescent in the morning, they're going to take it for sleep. But the majority of the research shows that about a, a one hour delay um, in school start time equates to about a 45 minute gain in sleep for adolescents. Compare that to most anything else we know in terms of an intervention, it's a pretty large effect size. Um, the Rand Corporation, which is a big think tank sort of in DC, they also took a look most recently at um, a number of school districts that made changes to school start time. Um, they were really looking at sort of the economic analysis of this situation because some school districts this requires some upfront cost. What they concluded was that within three years, um, any school start time changes were cost neutral. And they came to that conclusion by way of a couple things here that I have listed. First was a reduction in motor vehicle crashes, um, hearkening back to that sleepy driving thing. Um, improvement in test scores in school districts, reduction in delinquency and tardy rates, and improved graduation rates. So um, when school districts have made these changes, uh, every school district seems to have its its own sort of quirks in terms of what is going to work best, um, but overall these are sort of the kinds of improvements that you probably could expect to see. Um, 
And I'd say, you know, overall walking away from this data, I think um, if we went into it saying, here's a lot of national data, where does East Penn fall? Largely, we look like the rest of the nation. And so when the CDC and the American Pediatric Association is raising red flags, um, they're raising red flags about this community too. I mean, it's the same problem. Um, so, yeah. So as a follow-up to that, um, outstanding research uh, presentation regarding adolescent sleep. I wanted to just provide the community with an update in terms of what our task force has envisioned and has planned for the next steps. One of the first things that we plan to do is expand our membership a bit because in doing research um, we have identified we know that there are several obstacles and as part some of those key obstacles would be looking at transportation. Um, another key obstacle would be our secondary students after school activities in which they're involved whether they're extracurricular activities athletic activities we know that many of our secondary students have jobs as well so in thinking about those obstacles we know that we need to expand membership in our task force so that we can actually begin to brainstorm how we might address those different obstacles Another key piece for us beyond just expanding our membership is to actually educate the East Penn community in terms of what our task force has learned about adolescent sleep. And so certainly a first step was to bring the information here to the board and the public this evening. Um, but we've certainly talked about the need to be proactive and continue to share this information with parents, students, teachers across the community. Another key piece for us, particularly as we look at the first half of the upcoming school year, would really is to analyze the use of time at the secondary level. And what I mean by that, or why we believe that's a critical first step, is because it's important for us to look at the number of minutes for which our secondary students are here with us. Many people make the assumption that if we are ever in the position of investigating a later school start time, possibly by an hour, some people then make the assumption that that means that the school day must then end an hour later. And we believe that the use of time analysis at the secondary level is really critical so that we can see how those minutes are being used, which of them are dedicated to core instruction, how many minutes do we have between classes, how many minutes do we have for lunch, so that we can really maximize instructional time and have a really firm understanding in terms of if we as a school community make a decision to move forward with adjusting start times, what does that start and end time actually look like? So we envision that that would also be um, work that we would do coming into the next school year. And as I also mentioned again, really developing and having a firm understanding of what those obstacles are as well as possible solutions to each of those obstacles. When we talked about education, another way in which we can continue to educate and communicate with the East Penn community um, is through web, our, our online presence. And so we have, as well as, as a committee, a plan to develop a web page in which we can continue to update our community, whether it's with the presentation, um, sharing survey results, just to be to include increase that transparency with the task force work so that ultimately there's no surprises with regard to where this work may eventually end up. And then as always our plan would be um, tentatively we're saying mid next school year in which we would come and report back to the board and the community regarding what did we find about that use of time and then what have we identified in terms of some of those obstacles what those potential solutions would be so that we can continue the discussion in terms of looking at our secondary start times and making a decision if it's right for the East Penn community to consider a change. Thank you. Should we have Ms. Adley and for you? Absolutely. Any any questions? And the other piece that I wanted to mention is we we um, are very fortunate to have multiple members of our of our task force here. Um, Mrs. Whitman, Mr. Povolitis, Dr. Kiraz, Ms. Armstrong, Mrs. Shearer is here as well. So um, certainly many members of our task force are here as well. 
board members have questions? Mr. Smith? I had two quick questions. Um, first of all, thank you for the presentation. It was fantastic. Um, slide number six, hmm. um, that was where the, you mentioned the sleepiness score. Yeah. Um, I'm just curious what, um, what that score means. Is that a percentage? Is that a raw score? Um, so, yeah, so, um, so it's a, there's eight questions, and uh, the strongest response would be a so this sort of like, so if you had responded that the sleepiness problem had occurred almost always to you, you would have reported a four. So that would have been like a top score of 32 if you said every time, all the time for every item. Um, that being said, this this where we're hovering um, in terms of adolescent sleepiness is at the level that um, this isn't a clinical scale, but certainly this is at the level that would be um, indicative of some problems with sleep deprivation. Um, so they are saying that they um, frequently, are, to many of the items, are experiencing those problems. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then the second question I had, and this may be um, one of our next steps. Um, you mentioned I think it was last slide that uh, one hour of delay equals or leads to according to the research 45 minute increase in total sleep time did the research um, say anything about how um, districts and communities uh, approach the challenges of extra extracurriculars and um, you know, sports and extra after school activities did it say anything about how they were able to push things back and still get that that benefit in sleep without messing everything up or we st is that still a little bit early for where yeah we're at i right mean now? quite frankly uh, to be honest with you it's the psychologists are less interested. <laughs> um, but I think actually, you know, when we went to Radnor, for example, I think reaching out to other school districts that have, have made some of these changes has been really informative in terms of, um, and I think there are quite a few good models of, of how to make some changes. There are also um, bad models. So, um, for example, I know in Rhode Island, in Providence, Rhode Island, they made a, a big change um, and they ended up walking it back because they didn't think through all of the challenges ahead of time. So I really sort of applaud the ways in which sort of we've approached this in terms of being really careful about like thinking about what are the challenges um, because the school districts I think that have jumped into it have ended up um, and having to jump themselves back. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions? I have two questions. One uh, for you, Dr. Bagley. Um, do you have, you mentioned a number of uh, school districts or high schools are making changes. Do you have an idea of what percentage of high schools are, um, have start times in line with the, eight, uh, is it 8.30? The, uh, 8.30 is sort of the recommendation recommended. of the American Pediatric Association. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know percentage wise. I know that there are certainly um, websites that are sort of uh, organizations that are promoting school start time changes that are actually doing a pretty good job of sort of cataloging who's making changes per state. Um, we were just reading recently that New Jersey has passed a law to, to look at school start time changes and they've, they've implemented um, trying to pilot it in at least five school districts. So, I mean, I, I think it's certainly, there's, there's movement when we went to Radnor too, they, they were talking about this at the state level too, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, thanks. And um, Ms. Campbell, one of the, uh, what slide was it? One of the slides took, talked about um, multiple pressures that are shortening sleep, and I know the task force is looking at school start times, but is there any uh, thought of looking at um, maybe in conjunction with the, um, how the school time is being um, spent um, looking at homework or coordination between different classes as a way to reduce the pressure on students at home. Well, certainly, um, when we talk about use of use of time, I think homework would play into that discussion. Yes, and and actually, as well in our survey. Um, that was something that was mentioned by both parents as well as students in terms of, you know, sort of this notion of if we look at adjusting school start time, we have students who are potentially ending school later and still having what some might describe as a significant amount of work that they have to do at home. So it really is just looking at all of those practices in general. 
Yeah. And we actually have, I mean, I didn't put it as part of this presentation because it's actually kind of complex, but we have a lot of data that we collected about how adolescents are spending their time after school that we can kind of dig into a little bit more as well. Okay. Yeah. And there was um, there was a comment or some some brief discussion just a minute ago about some things happening at the state level, and and just to remind the the board that it was in fall of 2018, so just this past school year, in which the PA Senate approved a joint state government commission who was charged with establishing an advisory committee specifically to study this concept of adolescent sleep and start times. And so we're expecting a report from that commission in mid-October 2019. So that would also be another you know, piece of information that can certainly add to our body of research. Any other questions? Mr. Champagne. Would it be possible, uh, Dr. Bagley mentioned there's a number of websites that are kind of coll collating a lot of this mm -hmm. data about what the, the districts that have implemented this. Could we get a, a list of where those are and what? Absolutely. You know, that, would, that would be very helpful to yep. get a little more feedback. And, Absolutely. Okay, thank you. I think that would also be information that we can continue to populate mm -hmm. on our website so that we're sharing that information with the community as well. Okay. Are there any other questions? Uh, Dr. Munson. I don't I have a question, um, but I wanted to actually respond to one of the questions you asked um, because I had this vague sense that I had seen the answer um, to the number of uh, school districts that do this. I, I don't actually know the answer, but the Centers for Disease Control um, has has studied this in terms of students, and it's less than one in, as of 2014, it's less than one in five American middle and high school students have a start time um, 8.30 or later, um, which is the recommendation of the major um, medical groups. Um, that was and as of 2014. It, I'm sorry? As of 2014. As of 2014. I suspect it's a little bit more now because there has, like this is this is not a wheel that requires reinvention. Um, yeah. But uh, it's it's also, um, they, some of their finding was also that it varies a lot by states. So there's some states um, where, almost, where almost all school districts are already 8.30 or later. Um, and there's some where there's almost none. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Thank you, Mr. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Bagley.